afternoon. Thank you for your patience. We had uh, just to go through some technical issues. Uh, my name is Muhammad Khalil or Muhammad Khalil. I'm the director of the Muslim Studies Program here at Michigan State. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all for this joint Muslim Studies uh, VIPP event. VIPP is visiting International, International Professional <laughs> Program. And we have the director, uh, Sin, Sin Yu Wu, here with us. Uh, and I want to especially thank the whole unit, VIPP, and, and we have many guests from VIPP with us in the room from Pakistan. We want to welcome you all. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Sharla Burnett. Sharla Burnett, Dr. Sharla Burnett, is the one who uh, recommended uh, our, our guest speaker today. So uh, I want to thank Sharla for that. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank all the co-sponsors as well. So they include the Arabic Studies Program, the A and I'm just reading them in alphabetical order, the Arabic Studies Program, the Asian Studies Center, uh, Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, and I see Vlad there for uh, SIRS, um, Department of Political Science, and maybe there are other uh, administrators here as well, Global Studies in the Arts and Humanities, uh, James Madison College, uh, Peace and Justice Studies, and uh, the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies and Modern Israel. I think I see, yeah, Professor Aronoff is there. So uh, I wanna thank you all uh, again. And now I'd like to, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker, and that is uh, Nizar Farsakh. Um, and the title of this lecture again is Palestinian History, Dem Demographics and Politics, Local and Diaspora. And um, Nizar Farsakh is lecturer of international affairs at George Washington University. Uh, he is a trainer on leadership, negotiations, and advocacy with over 20 years of experience across the Middle East and North Africa. Before joining George Washington University, Nizar was head of civil society partnerships at the Project on Middle East Democracy, where he built the advocacy capacity of Arab civil society organizations. Before that, he directed the Palestinian delegation in Washington, D.C. between 2003 and 2008. Excuse me, between 2003 and 2008, Nizar advised senior Palestinian leaders, including the president, the prime minister, and various ministries in their negotiations with Israel. Currently, and in addition to teaching uh, negotiations at the Elliott School, Nizar co-founded an online leadership training platform, Inspire Leadership School, and is frequently invited by think tanks and the media uh, to comment on Middle East affairs. So please join me in welcoming Nizar Farsa. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, please remind me to keep looking at the Zoom so that I don't forget I, this is being recorded. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, the way I would like to uh, do this talk is to like talk 30, 40 minutes about uh, different aspects I think are important for people to understand about Palestinian history, demographics, geography, and politics, and then engage in a, in a conversation to the extent that uh, you have similar experience or you have different input on, on that issue. Because I think it's, um, of course, I'm partial because I'm Palestinian, but I also think that the Palestine-Israel conflict is in and of itself anthropologically interesting. And there's a lot in it that is um, transferable or uh, uh, accessible to different types of, or many, many types of, of other conflicts, but also the human condition. So that's, that's the part I'm interested in. In, and I would like to engage in a uh, conversation. Um, one additional thing I would like to say, just the way it colors my presentation, is that I've had my own transformations. Uh, I was born and raised in Dubai to a Palestinian father and an Italian mother. So very early on, I was sensitized to cultural differences and that there are parallel worlds uh, that have different sets of values, both of which could be valid. valid. Um, and uh, then I studied in Lebanon in the American University of Beirut just after the civil war, which I learned a lot from, just from the personal experiences of people there, how, how was the civil war, how it precipitated and what are people thinking in building their new country. Uh, and then moved in 99 with my parents uh, to Palestine to my father's village, which is Birzeit, it's just north of Ramallah. Um, because back then in 99, we thought the Palestinian state was right around the corner. So my father was thinking, why would you, why would we, why would I retire in Jordan when I can retire in my home village, right? Uh, of course, <laughs> we went there, we built a house, we moved there, and then we had that in the Fada. Um, and there, um, in 99, I was working, I, I lived in Brazil, but I worked in Bethlehem. So I had to go from uh, Ramallah to Jerusalem to Bethlehem every day. 
and uh, that or using public transport. And that really helped me immerse myself in Palestinian society. So the things I learned just riding the cab with other people, the, the conversations we'd have, uh, the differences between North and South and refugee and, and uh, city dweller and, and the racisms we have in between us, people in Jerusalem, people who are not from Jerusalem and so on and so forth. Uh, as well as my work was a lot of field work. My, my job was to monitor Israeli settlement activities and their impact on uh, the environment. So I actually got to do a lot of field work, especially the year before the Intifada because we could travel everywhere. Uh, and really got to know uh, the West Bank, at least. I went to Gaza a few times, but not enough. But the West Bank, I got to really know firsthand and have a big network. So when I got the opportunity to work with the Palestinian negotiating team, I was hesitant because I was thinking, and we were talking about this, Charla, this morning, about, um, I, I, I had a lot of misgivings about the Palestinian leadership. I thought they were corrupt and incompetent. But at the same time, I realized the, the, the limited capacity of civil society and its own issues. So I felt, you know what, uh, maybe if I work from inside government, I can have some impact. And uh, worst comes to worst, at least I would understand how the system works from the inside. And indeed, that's what happened. Uh, five years into the, uh, after the, uh, working there for five years, I did come up with the conclusion that they are corrupt and they are incompetent. <laughs> I just could say so authoritatively now because I actually worked with them. Not all of them, of course, but understanding that it's a system. Uh, the, uh, the system, uh, you can't have a situation of colonial, uh, you know, uh, uh, colonial occupation uh, with a fully free and democratic uh, uh, state. This is just not going to happen, right? I, I, I've been in several situations where with all the best intentions, when push comes to shove, if Israel didn't want to do something, it just didn't do it, right? So it didn't matter how much planning you did, if it didn't fit the, uh, the, the interest of the occupation, I don't want to say Israel, the interest of the occupation and the military complex in Israel, then we couldn't build the industrial uh, areas where we wanted, we couldn't put the terminals where we wanted, and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of that experience was thanks to working with uh, former Prime Minister Fayyad, where I could see those day-to-day uh, challenges. How do you, you know, try to forward Palestinian best interest while at the same time not compromising our national interests, right? Borders, what have you. Uh, and having to, yes, we need to fight the occupation, but we also need to live because if we, if we don't have a sustainable, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, strong uh, society, we will not have the energy and the resources to fight the occupation and truly liberate Palestine. So that's that's where uh, all of this uh, came about. After five years, I left because the fighting between Fatah and Hamas, the two major parties, really broke my heart. The stuff I saw from the inside are even worse than what got reported. Uh, got quickly disillusioned, but mostly confused because I felt like I didn't know my people. I didn't know what we were uh, doing. And if, if we're able to do this to each other, then Israel is even a smaller problem, right? Uh, so I left and did this leadership uh, program at the Kennedy School at Harvard, and I fell in love with it because I felt it, I found my calling, because I felt uh, the courses I took in leadership were courses that um, helped me enable um, the, the, the barrier or like to, to uh, unhinge the barriers that we have in Palestinian society specifically, but also the Arab and Muslim world uh, more uh, uh, generally. Because I can, as I said, I see what's happening in Palestine as a microcosm of what's happening in the world, how people uh, treat each other. And I have been a trainer. I, I stayed one more year to be a teaching assistant with two uh, uh, major professors at the Kennedy School. And then I, um, I did different uh, jobs, but also training on the side. So that's that I, I share that background to color uh, my presentation uh, with the purpose of uh, having a conversation with you guys on how we see uh, what is the work forward uh, to those who believe that Palestine Israel matters, uh, but also to the extent that it reflects on issues here in the United States, uh, because they're all issues of power inequality and, um, and racism, basically. Uh, and there are a lot of parallels and a lot of lessons to be learned uh, both ways. So without further ado, uh, the outline would be just history and geography in general, uh, key points, the demographics uh, of Palestinians uh, or the Palestinian population, and then the politics. Um, for those who don't know, the Palestine and Israel lie in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
um, you have Egypt, you have Jordan, you have Syria and Lebanon surrounding it, and Saudi Arabia, Iraq, close enough, and Iran, of course. Um, one of the things that the Palestinians pride themselves in is that Jericho is uh, one of the oldest continuously inhabited uh, uh, cities in the world. It's 10,000 years old. I think we're competing with Damascus on this. Um, and the other is um, our pride in our history, that we are not a new people, right? We are a very ancient people. And, um, and that's part of our pride. Like it's all of that is part of our history. Uh, and I'll get more into it. And this is just, uh, for example, uh, this bird was, is the logo of the Institute for Palestine Studies. And it's a symbol of um, how we as Palestinians are an ancient people and our culture and history carries a lot of um, uh, centuries and millennia of experiences, right? So one of the, if you meet any Palestinian, you know, every second word they say is, we have a saying in Palestine, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of proverbs, a lot of, it all comes from a very ancient uh, people who just uh, 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 took their proverbs forward to the next generation. So that's something that's very important in, uh, in, in the Palestinian uh, uh, you know, uh, psyche. The other, I mean, just to understand the, the origin of the word Palestine, regardless if there was a state called Palestine or not, the origin of the word comes from the Philistines, um, a people, a, a seafaring people, that were in the area of uh, Gaza and uh, a bit north. Uh, but for us, it's not that relevant. These were one of many people that lived in that area. It's not like we are those same Philistines uh, 3,000 uh, uh, years forward. We don't believe that at all. In fact, uh, the thing about Palestine is that everybody and their cousin conquered us, right? Uh, a lot of people came from very different spaces and a lot of people stayed. So this is just a, a, a general list to canonize Egyptians, uh, Philistines, Israelites, Phoenicians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, Romans, and so on and so forth. So all of these people or all of these empires uh, uh, conquered uh, Palestine and you had the, the boundary of that space changed uh, a lot, but the people were the same. They would, the, the, there would be additions to them, but essentially it was the same set of people doing the same kind of agriculture and, uh, 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 trade and whatever, and, and politics also. Uh, so one thing to differentiate is uh, the conquering peoples, right? So you had Arab Muslim conquest, you had the Crusaders, uh, you had the Mongols, right? So they, these were empires that came and ruled the land with all its people, a Jewish, Christian, Muslim, uh, atheist, whatever, Zoroastrian, you had Zoroastrians, Baha'is. Um, and all sorts of uh, uh, people. So that is different from uh, the people, right? So you had the empires and you had the people. And of course there was a mix of the two. And one of the things that um, also we, we say in, in Palestinian, you know, uh, uh, as Palestinians in general, is that Palestine is a place that gets a lot of people, those who mix and add to it stay, and those who insist on having an exclusionary right to it, ultimately get kicked out. Either you come and get digested into this place and add to it for sure. Uh, but if you try to carve something for yourself, you're just gonna get kicked out. Um, so that's also a very important thing uh, that uh, Palestinians feel is a principle that Palestinians have, that we don't have a problem with people living with us. We have a problem with people living instead of us, right? So the sensitivity that Palestinians have over the partitioning of the land, that's the main argument that the Zionists have against the Palestinians is that the Palestinians never accepted partition. That is true because we never thought of partition as uh, uh, either practical, because historically speaking, it never worked, but also uh, ethically uh, it was wrong because we want to, we've always lived together. We've managed to live together with different uh, religions and different uh, ethnicities. Uh, partitioning uh, only uh, uh, creates um, uh, um, exclusive rights that is just a, an anathema to the way this place, this holy land or this special place uh, functions. It doesn't function through separation. Um, one important thing that is, uh, that um, has shadows until today is a very important event that happened uh, in the 1700s, which is um, the Arab and Muslim world encounter with the West when Napoleon conquered Egypt. And that's important because we had 
uh, a few centuries of Ottoman rule where there was very little, um, well, the first centuries, uh, there was a lot of progress, but then there was a lot of very little progress and there was a lot of stagnation, both economically, but also more into, uh, importantly, intellectually. Uh, and this backwardness uh, with Europe being very uh, 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 like progressing and um, the Arab and Muslim world uh, uh, going backwards, um, when we encountered Napoleon, we were shocked at the level to which the West had progressed and how they had cannons and how they had much stronger armies and they used science and we were so backwards. In fact, when the British told the Mamluks who were ruling Egypt back then that the, um, that the French, that Napoleon is coming to conquer Egypt, they said, oh, we'll just stomp them with the hoofs of our horses, not realizing what they were up against. So, yeah, go ahead. Just the folks on Zoom are not seeing the slides, so I'm just going to try another share screen. I'm so sorry. Sure. So no sorry problem. about that. And we'll be sharing the slides. I hope that works for those who are watching. So the Arabs and Muslims were confronted with the reality of a very strong and um, modern uh, uh, West and a very weak and backwards East. So there, was, there were two schools of thought. One school of thought said, they are so uh, advanced, we need to learn everything from them and become like them and even get better at what they do so that we are able first to be safe from their, them conquering us and ruling us, but also to progress. And others who were saying, no, uh, this happened because we moved away from tradition, we moved away from orthodoxy, we moved away from the ways of the, uh, the original ways of the prophet, we need to go back to the origins, to go back to pure Islam, this kind of puritanical, right? So these two schools of thought continue to this day. In the whole Arab and Muslim world, the whole conversation is how much change and how much tradition? Is this a new story or is it an old story? How much of the new we want to take and how much of the old we want to keep, right? Because both, we realize that both cannot be at the same uh, uh, level. And it's so just a question of, uh, extent of change or extent of uh, continuity. So Turkey, Tunisia versus Saudi Arabia, right? Turkey as a Turk uh, uh, got rid of, uh, you know, uh, Arabic script and brought Latin script and uh, 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 did a lot of changes while Saudi Arabia doubled down on, you know, uh, traditional Islam and in fact had a very narrow interpretation, or had interpretation of Islam that uh, robbed, I would argue, Islam of a lot of its richness, right? If, if anything, I'm not that religious. I used to be religious, but then I stopped. Um, I say, I tell people I, I believe in God. I, I just have issues with him. Um, but I, from that, I, I'm bringing, there were a lot of questions that I had about tradition and faith and belief uh, that challenged me when I, uh, you know, there was a lot of dissonance. And not so ironically, it's only when I came to the U.S. did I discover a much richer Islam uh, that simply was not presented to me in Dubai, right? In Dubai, they were specifically looking for a very narrow one that, uh, 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 you know, sanctified obedience. Obedience was the most important value, right? Conveniently, because it's a system that's not interested in, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, democratic uh, change and so on and so forth. Why in the US, because we do have, we still happen to have freedom of religion and freedom of thought and freedom of expression to some extent, um, you could actually have access to all of this uh, very rich literature and jurisprudence uh, of Islam that looks at uh, tradition and, and modernity in, in the sense of what's the point of, of your faith if it's not reflected in real time in real impact on the ground. So necessarily in different, Islam is going to have to be different in different places in different times, right? Uh, so I give all of this background because uh, it's without it, you cannot understand the political fissures we have in Palestinian society because they are not really very different from political fissures we have in Pakistan or in, in Libya or in Tunisia or even in, in, in different parts of uh, Africa and uh, Asia. So that's basically the pillar of how much tradition versus how much modernity and what does that uh, uh, look like. Um, let me just click again. Oh, so I'm good. Okay. Um, 
So we talked about con conquerors, and these are different from people who happened to settle in Palestine, right? There is an important distinction that needs to be done here. So for example, um, a lot of people don't know that there are around 300 to 400 uh, Jews living, Samaritan Jews living in uh, Mount Jerzim in Nablus, which is in the West Bank. These are Jews that never left. These are Jews who were there for literally thousands of years. Of course, they got per persecuted in several uh, uh, periods, uh, but they're very proud of their very <laughs> orthodox and traditional uh, character. And they argue that they are the real Jews and the Jews that went to Babylon lost a lot of their language and a lot of the, of the traditions. And in fact, when you go, I highly recommend if you ever go there to go to their museum, they argue that there are specific, there's a specific letter in, uh, uh, or like uh, the alphabet, they kept the old alphabet and the old Hebrew compared to the uh, Hebrew that got developed in, in Babylonia, in, in diaspora, that actually explains and uh, uh, um, uh, designates what was the route that the uh, Jews took in Sinai when they uh, were lost for 40 years. And a lot of specifications about what is the role of uh, Jerusalem and what is the role of Jerusalem and so on and so forth. So that's an interesting aspect of just one community that lived in Palestine has that version of history. Um, uh, Christian Arabs, right? So Jesus was uh, born in Nazareth and then uh, uh, lived in Bethlehem and then died in, in Jerusalem, right? So the Christian uh, uh, Palestinians are very proud of their heritage and they consider themselves being the original Christians and they get offended when Western Christians come to them lecturing them about Christianity. It's like, who the hell are you telling us when we are literally the descendants of, of Jesus, right? So there is that character. Um, and then also pilgrims, whether Christian or Muslim, um, that came and then decided to stay. We have, I have a friend, he's from Nazareth. His family his name is Rock and he, they, they are actually, he, he traces their uh, family back to French crusaders who simply just stayed after the crusades, right? So we have, in fact, Sinjil is a town that's famous for being <laughs> crusader leftovers. So that character of Palestine is, is really very important to us is that uh, when, when you hear the narrative, oh, the Muslims came and they changed everything. It's like, that's actually not true. Yes, they conquered. Yes, they imposed the Islamic rule, right? But the society itself was actually very mixed uh, and, um, uh, and um, it, it, it got its own character as the people of the Holy Land. Like the Palestinians or the people of the Holy Land are different from, uh, let's say, the people in Egypt, the people in, uh, in, in the Gulf and so on and so forth. They had this special character of being in, uh, on the east side of the Mediterranean and uh, um, the, this this character or the sense of being uh, uh, the bulwark or or the first line of defense of the east that invaders always come here first in order to get to the rest of the orient and therefore we always saw ourselves as the first line of defense and um, uh, even with the crusades right like the crusades killed a lot of Christian uh, Palestinians who who lived there right because it was the same population it was a population that saw itself as one even. Uh, uh, when they were from different uh, denominations. Uh, similarly, uh, the Hajj, uh, if you go to Jerusalem, uh, there is the African quarter in the old city that is made of you know, uh, Africans from Chad, from Nigeria, from different places who came to pilgrimage in Mecca, said, okay, while we did this very long voyage that took months to get here, we might as well pass by Jerusalem. And then they just stayed, right? Uh, there is a Central Asian people from um, Kazakhstan and, and uh, Bukhara and other places also who are in the old city. Jews who escaped persecution historically, even before the 1800s, would come to Jerusalem or just uh, Jews of different parts of the world who wanted to be buried in the Mount of Olives, right? So we always had Jews, in addition to the Jews that lived, as we said, in Jerusalem, in Safad, in Hebron, these for us are Palestinian Jews, Jews of the land. Uh, and Armenian and Assyrian uh, uh, genocides uh, in the early 1900s also uh, ended up in, uh, in Palestine. So you cannot describe the Palestinians as one homogeneous tribe. That's, that's the main thing you wanna say, right? It is the people of the land, but they're not a, a tribe per se. They're not one homogeneous, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ethnic stock for sure. And in fact, there were uh, um, genetic studies that showed that um, uh, Eastern, uh, Israelis of uh, Oriental origins have more genetic uh, uh, material common with Arabs than they have with Western uh, Israelis who came from uh, European countries, right? It's, it's the same, let's say, uh, genetic stock. Um, 
uh, I'm sure a lot of you know the history, but basically as far as politics, once there was the political project of creating a Jewish state in Palestine, Zionism, right, in 1897, uh, that is, in our opinion, the start of the conflict, when there was a people who wanted exclusive right to the land, um, uh, or at the very least, even if Arabs would live there, they would live under uh, uh, Jewish rule. But what was important in Zionism is that Jews wanted to live in a place where they had the majority, where they were not under the, uh, you know, the mercy of the majority, because it, historically speaking, the history has been one in which they got persecuted. So the, the, the need for having majority Jewish rule is the essence of Zionism, right? So while I am a person who uh, uh, was at the receiving end of the um, violations of Zionism, I learned that it's not my job to prove that Zionism uh, is a, a bad ideology. If Israelis or if Zionists have a version of Zionism in which I have my full rights, I'm perfectly fine with that, right? Because ultimately I want to have full rights. I want to be independent. I want to be equal. I want to be, uh, have my human rights uh, respected. If there is a version of Zionism that does, does that, great. Just as much as we, when you argue with Islamists or Islamic groups who argue that Muslims need to be on top and Christians and Jews will have preferential treatment, but they cannot be judges, they cannot be uh, presidents or what have you. And that's, that for me is also a, a, a challenge and I believe in uh, equality uh, uh, of uh, peoples. So what matters more is what is the practical implication on the ground, not what theoretically should happen. Even in the United States, we're supposed to be equal, but we still, have, we still see people of color being treated differently, regardless of what the law stipulates. And that is something that is that continues to be a very difficult uh, um, question to answer also for Palestinians. Like when I argue with my cousins and my friends over, okay, we have a situation where Palestinians, uh, Arabs and Jews are um, equal uh, in, in terms of population. Uh, what do we do with the Jews that are living here who are third and fourth and fifth generation, right? Like they have rights too. They're not gonna go to Poland. There is no Poland, they're not Polish, right? Um, and that is a question that Palestinians are not uh, many, or I would argue majority of Palestinians are not ready to answer, and we can get, go more into that, understandably, because they have a more, uh, a, a more real or more present danger, which is the occupation. They are constantly harassed, their houses are demolished, they get killed on checkpoints and so on. So they're seeing that, they cannot see far to the future. But there are some amazing people that I admire a lot that are so magnanimous and understand that our freedom as Palestinian Palestinians cannot be uh, detached from the freedom and equality and self-actualization of the Jewish Israelis that are on the other side that may have treated us in all sorts of horrible ways, right? But if we're going to have a future, it needs to be a future that's consensual, a future that ha results in uh, um, uh, equality and respect for security and, uh, and dignity for all uh, people, regardless of race and ethnicity. Uh, an important aspect that you, you hear Islamists raise a lot, because, and that's an important distinction also, uh, that the Ottomans, who were the rulers of Palestine up until British conquest in 1917, in the First World War, uh, the Ottoman Sultan refused to uh, sell uh, parts of Palestine to the Zionists, despite a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, lucrative offers. And Islamists would argue that that is uh, what matters, is that uh, Islamic identity supersedes national identity. And look at uh, the Sultan Abdul Hamid, who is Turkish, who is not Arab, and he still would not sell that land because Islamic identity is more important. The secular Palestinians would not make that argument. Um, so from the Islamist perspective, the loss of the Caliphate in 1923, when the Turks uh, uh, abolished the Caliphate, was the, the let's say, the, 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 the original sin uh, and they want to bring back uh, time to a, a, a larger Islamic caliphate that uh, um, restores uh, the rule of Islam in all of these regions, while the seculars would have a totally uh, different secular nationalist argument of history, which starts with 1948. Uh, of course, you had Turkish nationalism, Young Turks, uh, and Arab nationalism, both movements that were, of course, very heavily influenced by the European idea of the nation state. Again, we need to remember that the nation state is a European idea that resulted in the Second World War, right? So Europe had to go through two uh, uh, world wars to understand the, the, the dangers 
of nationalism. And we're, now we're with, with like the rise of the right uh, today, right? We see again the ugly face of, of uh, hyper-nationalism and, and what it results with. So back in the uh, early 1900s, uh, 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 Turkish and Arab nationalism was, uh, were very important forces in, in, in the political spectrum. Uh, Afghani Muhammad Abdu and Taha Hussein, uh, different characters uh, um, who were uh, engaging uh, that wrestling between modernity and uh, Islam. Uh, um, so there is a very famous, famous uh, quote by Muhammad Abdu. Muhammad Abdu was an imam from Al Azhar, was a progressive uh, uh, Islamist who, who believed that Islam needed modernization. And he went to live in France for a while and then came back to Egypt. And when he comes back to Egypt, the Egyptians tell him, what did you find in the land of infidels? Uh, and he said, I found Islam and I didn't find Muslims. I came back to Egypt to find Muslims and not find Islam, right? <laughs> Arguing that equality and fraternity uh, 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 and the use of science are actually values of Islam, right? In, in Islam, we learn that uh, 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 learning and scholarship is a, a duty for every Muslim and Muslima, right? Uh, and we don't find that. So his argument is that Muslims are not being good Muslims, but there is no, nothing wrong with Islam. The secularists would say, no, we need to uh, either get rid of Islam, like Tur Turkey or what have you, or uh, we need to modernize Islam to, uh, to a place that's very different from uh, what it started with. And th this is, again, the main contention between the two schools of thought in the whole Arab world. And of course, Palestine is one of them. We said about the uh, and, and encounters. Um, we don't, I mean, this is again the history of the partition. From the Palestinian perspective, all of Palestine was a land and we didn't see the need for partitioning. Um, and the main argument, of course, is that uh, Jews in um, Palestine before uh, 1948, in fact, in 19, before the Second World War, were less than 10% of the whole population. And of course, with ho the Holocaust, there was a big influx, but also during the British mandate, so between the two. Uh, world wars, there was uh, um, a lot of immigration of, of uh, uh, Jewish Zionists who came from Europe and other places to Palestine. And before the war in 1948 and 1947, uh, the Jews still constituted 30% of the whole population. And yet the partition plan gave the Jews 54% uh, of Palestine and gave uh, the people who were 70% of the population gave them 44% of Palestine. So. Uh, even while the Palestinians and the Arabs in general refused the idea of partition and in principle, even if they accepted it, it wasn't even an equal partition. It was giving 30% uh, population, 54% of, of the land. So that's one of the arguments that the Palestinians make. Uh, and, um, uh, and the fact that after, uh, well, of course, there, was, uh, there were clashes before May 15th, 1948, uh, in which around 200,000 uh, Palestinians were uh, expelled or fled uh, the villages that were attacked. So the, the, the Nakba, the refugees uh, 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 story started before May 15th, 1948. Um, but at the end of the war, there was anywhere between 600 to 750,000 Palestinians who fled or were expelled from their houses and the Israelis never let them back in. So even if there's an argument that, well, these people left because of the war, um, if, uh, if we are to respect their uh, human rights, they have a right to come back and Israel refused them the right to come back. And that uh, is the argument of the ethnic cleansing uh, of uh, Palestine. And the last thing I wanna say about history is that Palestinians had a very thriving uh, uh, society, community. It didn't start in 1948, um, you had, uh, uh, you know, uh, big businesses, the Jaffa uh, oranges were, uh, you know, um, very famous in, in Europe, uh, and there were Palestinian uh, uh, orchards. Uh, you had uh, the Gaza airport, you had uh, art, you had, uh, you know, Arabic singers that would sing in Jerusalem and Yaffa, especially, it was famous back then. And you had uh, women's societies, one of the first women's societies were in Palestine before uh, the Second World War, and so on and so forth. So there is a whole, uh, um, uh, you know, society. That in fact got shattered in 1948. And that's something people uh, underestimate um, or don't really understand. If you want to understand Palestinians, you want to understand that the, the trauma of a, um, a shattered society. That is, we had, you know, of course, like any society, we had classes, we had nobles, and we had uh, uh, heads of clans, and we had peasants, and we had villagers, and we had, uh, uh, you know, worksmiths, and, and so on. 
the war happened and people fled and ended up in refugees, right? So you had people from cities and people from villages suddenly in the same refugee camp, right? Somebody who was the mayor of a town suddenly had nothing in that refugee camp. And somebody who was, you know, a peddler in, in his town in the refugee camp because he had a gun, he was suddenly prominent. So all of that is, you know, uh, confusion and, and scattering of, of and, and breakage of the social network uh, was in fact very traumatic. So the fact that we survived and we managed to uh, pick up the pieces and rebuild our society in and of, its, uh, in and of itself is a, a story of, of, um, of resilience and, and uh, um, the, the power of the human condition. And that is something that we're very, very proud of. Um, we talked about the partition. So again, the, the issue of a partition is that uh, Israel gets, or the Zions get more and more of the land and we get less and less of it. So it's always a sense of, of, of fragmentation and uh, uh, lessening of power on the ground. This is currently uh, uh, the map where the areas in, in dark uh, uh, red or like in burgundy, if you want, are the areas where Palestinians have uh, um, security and civil control. The areas in green, Palestinians have civil control, but Israel has excuse me, over uh, superseding security control, and the white areas of the West Bank are completely under Israeli control. So Palestinians are living in uh, islands of control and not complete control because Israel continues to control the air, the, the water, and more importantly, the population registry. That is, you're not Palestinian until Israel decides that you are Palestinian. When I need to apply, when I have a, a child, uh, I need to register, I register in the Palestinian Ministry of Interior, but that application goes to the Israeli authorities to then give an ID number. So the control over the registry is the ultimate proof of the fact that Israel continues to rule over the Palestinians, even when you have something called the Palestinian Authority that in fact has very little authority. When, uh, for example, the highest executive, the Palestinian president, the chief executive in Palestine needs to get an Israeli permit to go from Ramallah to Bethlehem, right? While any Israeli soldier, foot soldier can walk into and go into somebody's house in Ramallah and arrest someone and nobody would ask them what you're doing, right? So you, it's called Palestinian authority, but that's actually a misnomer because it has in fact very little authority. Any authority it has is authority that's residual uh, uh, and temporary because Israel allows it and that's it. And that's something I learned from, again, Prime Minister Fayyad is that, yeah, anything we're, yeah, we say we have a government and we have an authority, but in fact, the things that we're able to do are things that Israel allows us to do. If we want to do something that Israel does not want, we literally cannot do it. Um, as far as demographics, um, in general, uh, around uh, two thirds of our population, I I'll go through the numbers uh, later, but we have a distributed uh, population. We have, um, uh, let me just go to the map, it's easier. So inside Palestine, we have around 5 million, around uh, a million and a half in Gaza and two and a half million in the West Bank. Uh, we have Palestinians who stayed in Israel in 1948 and became Israeli citizens. There are now 2 million. And then in the diaspora, we have another uh, uh, 5 million. So we're, I mean, we're pretty scattered. Uh, more than half is within uh, Palestine or Israel, uh, but they all have different situations. So Palestinian citizens of Israel, have Israeli citizenship. And uh, while they are uh, citizens, there are laws that discriminate against them in practice, right? Like there isn't one law that's exactly discriminatory, but in, in the totality of the laws, they end up discriminated against. And in fact, the last uh, uh, um, nation state law in, in Israel actually uh, downgraded Arabic uh, and uh, made it not an official language. And that in and of itself is a form of discrimination. So, but they can travel, they have an actual passport that they can use in uh, other places. They have access to the Israeli market and they have, in general, they have a better economic status. Palestinians in the West Bank have Palestinian IDs and get Palestinian passports. Um, there are um, um, 134 countries that recognize Palestine as a state. So it's kind of a better situation. Uh, in the Gaza Strip also they get Palestinian IDs uh, and in Jerusalem, the Palestinians that were in Jerusalem when they got occupied in 1967, Israel decided to treat them as Jordanian permanent residents of uh, Israel. That is, they do not have Israeli citizenship. They cannot vote in Israeli politics. They can vote in Jerusalem municipality elections, but not in Israeli elections. Uh, but they're also not part of the PA. They're not part of the Palestinian Authority. They have Jordanian passports and uh, they have access to the Israeli economy 
and they get, uh, you know, uh, um, healthcare, public healthcare, and and you know, uh, pensions. But at the same time, uh, there are uh, uh, very strict regulations. There are higher taxes. They don't get services, and so on and so forth. Different ways in which they're discriminated because, from Israeli perspective, they're not Israeli citizens. They're permanent residents, and therefore, uh, they don't get the same rights, and so on and so forth. So that's a big challenge for the Palestinians. Again, we're we're not only fragmented, but we're living in different legal, political, uh, economic systems. And that makes life much harder. And add to that, that after the Intifada with all the checkpoints, in fact, the reality of life has been such that people stop seeing each other. I have friends, uh, Christian friends from uh, Jerusalem who simply don't date people from Ramallah or Bethlehem because it's such a hassle. If they do get married, they, uh, they are unlikely to get family reunification so the family cannot live together, right? Even I have a friend, she's a Palestinian citizen of Israel, so she's a citizen. She had the bad idea of marrying a Palestinian from Ramallah who has a Palestinian ID. And for 10 years, she could not uh, live with him in Jerusalem. So she ended up uh, uh, immigrating from Israel and now she lives in the States, right? So these are realities that Palestinians live and that causes a lot of, a lot of let's say, uh, internal domestic uh, frictions that we have in Palestine are uh, directly related to the reality on the ground, the fragmented reality that Israel continues, or the occupation continues to in, enforce. Um, the quick, or, or like four uh, main, uh, let's say, uh, shades, let's say, of, 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 of identity, Palestinian identity. One is, as we said, the secular religious, uh, and it's the same divide as in any, any uh, society, people who believe in living uh, um, a religious Islamic life and people who believe you know, in a secular life where there needs to be a separation of church and, and state. Uh, refugee and non-refugee, like any uh, population or any peoples, uh, there is classism in Palestine. So um, ironically, while uh, the refugees were uh, preeminent in, in the resistance, uh, they, of course, were in the refugee camps and they were part of the, they actually started the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization was started by refugees, right? So the, the, the bulk and, and the bulwark of the, of the Palestinian or the engine of the Palestinian resistance movement was the refugees. At the same time, uh, people who were from villages and from town who had assets, the urban especially, uh, looked down at refugees, right? Because the refugees didn't have assets, they were poor, they wouldn't want to marry from them. And I'm like, even my aunt who like was very active in the first intifada had issues with my cousin because she wanted to marry a refugee, right? So these, these class issues continue to exist and reflect in Palestinian politics. So uh, uh, her husband, who's a refugee, he's, uh, he was very active in, in Fatah party. And after 10 years, he left because he realized that he could not rise up in the ranks of Fatah because he was a refugee, right? And in the West Bank, uh, they did not, he wasn't part of the right uh, uh, clique of refugees and therefore didn't have any future in the party. Uh, similarly, uh, um, well, Gaza is a similar situation in the sense that Gaza itself, uh, the majority of the population are refugees. They're not actually from Gaza because a lot of the refugees who came from the coast ended up in Gaza. So over 70% of the population of Gaza are not from Gaza and that, that tension too, who's from Gaza and who's from other places of Gaza and, and, and um, and, and the tensions there, again, discrimination, who's more conservative, who's, who becomes part of the party, who doesn't, Hamas, uh, Jihad, and so on. And finally, the diaspora. Um, different uh, uh, populations because they are in different situations. The people in Palestine, as we said, they had different situations, whether citizens of Israel or West Bank or Gaza or Jerusalem. But then the people who are living in Dubai or in the States like myself, we're not under the same pressure, right? So it's easy for us to take extreme position or radical positions because we're not, we can wait for Palestine to be liberated in the coming 500 years, right? While my cousins who are there, literally their land is being stolen in front of their eyes, right? So they are uh, um, either more radical in the sense that they want complete war and what have you, or they're more willing to compromise and say, okay, we're willing to accept, accept the compromise because getting 20% uh, uh, um, of something is better than 100% of nothing, right? So understanding that difference in the side, even Hamas, right? So Hamas in the Gaza Strip is different from Hamas in the West Bank, is different from Hamas in Syria and Qatar, right? And people were <laughs> commenting about how Hani, once Hani stayed in, in, in Qatar, he became much fatter, <laughs> right? And it's just the reality of life, right? Like, what, what do you actually stand to lose? Uh, um, the, the, the balance of power in Hamas between uh, who's 
where is it? Is it with the, 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 the leaders that are in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, or the leaders that were outside? When, when there was a lot of money coming from outside, a lot of political work in the outside, um, it was the, the actors in, uh, in Syria and Qatar that had more influence. But then when there were rockets in, in the Gaza Strip and there was internal politics and there were elections, the, uh, the, the Hamas members in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank became suddenly more prominent. Um, so again, understanding that relationship between uh, uh, diaspora and, and uh, people in, in Palestine is important to understand the, the politics. Um, finally, I, what I wanted to just show, and this is of course a very coarse uh, um, uh, graphic, uh, there's a spectrum, of course, uh, conservative religious versus secular and, and left in general. Again, again, this is very general. Uh, so I would say this is the way it looked 10, 15 years ago where in general, uh, you may have, uh, if we start from the top, you have different Islamists that are uh, to the right of Jihad Islami, Jihad Islami. A lot of people don't understand the difference between Jihad Islami and Hamas. The main difference is that Jihad Islami is a bit more principled and uh, Hamas is more practical, more pragmatic, right? So uh, when uh, there was also process, the peace process, and there were elections for the PA, in 1996, Hamas boycotted it and Jihad Islami because they were against Oslo. But then in 2006, when Hamas saw an opportunity in, in joining the elections, they joined the elections. And Jihad Islam criticized them. In fact, because they said, no, th this is unprincipled. And in fact, a lot of people from Hamas quit Hamas and joined Jihad Islami because they were against this pragmatic decision to join the election. No, out of principle, we reject all of Oslo, so we cannot join the elections. So understanding that difference. And the other difference is that Jihad Islami is uh, more hierarchical, right? While Hamas is, in fact, uh, um, uh, more... Uh, grounds up uh, grassroots organization. Uh, to their credit, they have their own, uh, you know, elections and their own uh, system, but they are less hierarchical than Jihad Islam, and that, and therefore, I would argue uh, there is more that could be done with Hamas than could be done with Jihad Islam. In fact, a lot of people in Jihad Islam now are the younger cadre of Jihad Islam are arguing to become more grassroots and less hierarchical because when they're very hierarchical, they're de very dependent on foreign aid, especially Iran. Fatih has another problem. Uh, Fatih has been the, is the oldest of the uh, of the militias and the political parties. It started in the 60s and in fact was the vanguard uh, and it started the PLO. It was the main uh, uh, part of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Secular, even if the, the origins are Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, um, that originated it, but in general they were secular uh, and now they are even more secular in order to distinguish themselves from Hamas especially after 2007, this issue of being secular, uh, because for many Palestinians, it is extremely important. They realize that it's important for, uh, for them as Fatah to, to keep harping on the idea that we are sec uh, secular, we're different from Hamas, we're not Taliban and so on and so forth, right? So that distinction was important for the recruitment and maintenance of their uh, cadre. And then you have the, the uh, I'm gonna talk about the independence more, the leftists, different leftist uh, uh, parties. Again, they were original in the 60s. Uh, Marxist Leninist uh, groups that had very strong ties to the Soviet Union, but always had a, 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 a small part. They, they never made more than 20, 30% of the PLO. Uh, and after the, the PA was created, they, they wouldn't make more than five, 10% of the uh, elections because they, 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 there was a lot of, uh, and I think that's classical of all or uh, most uh, leftist movements in the Arab Muslim world where they, they tend to be elitist, they tend to be very, um, you know, uh, uh, big on, on, on theory and, and not, on, on not being on the ground. Um, so that's, in general, the distribution. And then you have this 10% that could go, go either way. And I would argue that, in fact, no party has a majority. There is a good uh, 40 to 60% of Palestinians that vote whatever they think is going to work. They're not ideological per se. They might be conservative. There are a lot of fact, people who are very conservative, right? And they uh, wear the veil and what have you, but in general, they're politically uh, liberal. Like they believe in, in uh, pluralism, they believe in freedom of thought and freedom of, of religion and so on and so forth. Uh, so the example I give is how uh, when Yasser Arafat uh, died uh, in 2005 and uh, um, uh, Mahmoud Abbas ran for elections, Mahmoud Abbas was not actually popular. In fact, he was famous that he was one of the first people in the 70s to argue for the two-state solution when it was extreme, it wasn't even unpopular, it was blasphemous to talk about the two-state solution in the 1970s. 
But to his credit, he was consistent. He believed that, practically speaking, there was no military defeat of Israel, so we need a political solution. Uh, and he stayed that way. And that's why he was very unpopular, because the idea of the two-state solution and separation was not popular for Palestinians. So Abbas did not have a constituency. However, uh, given the experience that the Palestinians had uh, in the Oslo process and with engaging in negotiations with Israel and Americans, uh, Palestinians knew that Abbas had very good relations with the Israelis and with the Americans, and that with Arafat, there was a lot of deadlock and we were getting nowhere. So Abbas got 65% of the vote, not because he was popular, but because the majority of Palestinians thought that if anybody could get something, it would be Abbas, because the Israelis and the Americans like him, right? So it was a very practical uh, uh, um, uh, vote. Uh, after a year, when he was unable to deliver, and people saw that uh, in South Lebanon, uh, uh, Hezbollah was able to get rid of uh, Israel just by resistance and without an agreement, Palestinians voted Hamas. I had Christian friends who voted Hamas in 2006 just because they felt, you know what, Abbas is not going to get us anything. Israelis only understand violence, right? So that was where the shift happened. And now, five years after that, with Hamas ruling uh, Gaza and all the challenges that Hamas had in ruling Gaza and the difficulties that people had living under Hamas rule, um, you had a strong uh, move toward independent, uh, independent politicians and independent politics and nonviolence. Nonviolence became much more popular uh, uh, five years into Hamas's rule in, in Gaza because people realized like there's a, a political maturation where uh, in the 50s and 60s, Palestinians were expecting Abdul Nasser to save them from outside. Then in the 70s and 80s, they were expecting Arafat to uh, save them from outside. But then when Arafat got kicked out to Tunis, Right? Palestinians realize that they need to depend on themselves, right? And with the election, something similar happened, right? Where Palestinians realize that uh, it's not Haniyeh, it's not Abbas that's gonna save us. We need to depend on ourselves. In fact, you had a lot of uh, nonviolent movements in different towns and villages that were in fact successful in pushing uh, the Israeli war or pushing, uh, pushing the occupation and uh, making uh, uh, land confiscation and settlements much more difficult for the Israelis just from depending on their own resources. Um, we can talk about regional politics, but I think it, in general, it's um, different countries have their stakes in, in the conflict for a variety of reasons. And that's always been a challenge for Palestinians. They would try to leverage that, but at times it was, uh, it, it was a burden. Um, uh, in the 60s and 70s, different Arab regimes would support different parts of the PLO for their own agendas. The, the Lebanese civil war was mired in all of that politics. Um, and likewise today, you have Iran, you have Saudi Arabia, you have Jordan, you have uh, Egypt. They all have their own interests and, they, and the Palestinian factions also play that card as well, right? So uh, I give the example of Hamas. Hamas was getting support from Syria, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia. Um, and then when, the, when Hamas uh, took a position against the Assad regime, of course, they were kicked out of Syria because uh, uh, Hamas had its own uh, ambitions with Turkey, with Erdogan, right? And then they had to walk their, uh, uh, um, themselves back to uh, improve their relations. And again, Qatar and the Gulf states playing that role. Ab uh, Arafat had to play the same with the Arab regimes in the 60s and 70s, where he was one, sometimes close to the Syrians, sometimes close to the Jordanians, sometimes close to the Egyptians, and so on and so forth. That, that vulnerability is always there. And the same with the uh, foreign actors, the Americans, the Europeans, and the Russians. Same way, uh, they have their own interests with the Palestinian factions. At the same time, the Palestinian factions try to play them. There is, of course, a power imbalance, but also there is uh, a mutual interest. And you cannot understand Palestinian internal domestic politics without understanding also uh, who's paying, like who's well, yeah, follow the money, right? Uh, but also who's who's helping in the diplomatic arena, who's uh, having influence on the ground, and so on and so forth. Um, the final thing I wanted to say here is the new, uh, um, what I've noticed is, is a difference now, and I was talking to Charla also about this, is that there's a new generation of Palestinians that while, th this is a generation that uh, grew up in the Second Intifada. So all they knew is disintegration, fragmentation, corruption, and war and occupation, right? Uh, they have very little faith in the Palestinian leadership uh, and also know very little about Palestinian history. So they, they're trying to live day by day, and they're not interested in the history. So that's concerning. But at the same time, they're also unencumbered by history either, right? So they have a sense of 
uh, this is not a life, I deserve better. And they're trying to do something about it. They're not waiting for their parents to tell them what to do. They're not looking backwards to see what could they uh, do better, right? So while they don't know the leaders of the 60s and 70s like uh, uh, Abu, uh, Abu Jihad and others, they have their own heroes, uh, the people who went to jail or were killed in, uh, in, in the five or uh, six last, uh, last year. So it's a different demographic. It thinks differently. There are a lot of very active uh, uh, women and young women, even uh, veiled you know, conservative women who also understand that I, I could be conservative, but I have my place and I have a right and I have, I have a right to work and I have the right to divorce and so on and so forth. In fact, we have, um, I think one of the first uh, um, female uh, Sharia judges uh, in Palestine, it was one of the first in the Arab world and so on and so forth. So th the demographic itself is, is changing. And I, I think um, in organic ways, and that is why they are fragmented and there is no, the, the challenge for Palestinians is that they actually no longer have a, a unified political platform. That is true. And that is a big uh, reason for the impasse. But at the same time, this is exactly what's allowing for something new to emerge. Um, so uh, I will leave you with this. If, if anything, if people are interested in, in engaging or supporting uh, the Palestinian cause, I would invite you to go there and visit and engage those people and see what do they see as the solution? What do they see as the kind of support uh, 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 they need? Because I think there's a lot for us to learn from them. Thank you very much. We take questions. Uh, we yes. have audience. We also have Zoom, uh, the Zoom questions. So, but I'll let you feel free to call who you'd like. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Uh, Zahida. My name is Zahida. My question is related with the, the fundament, fundamental philosophy of Islam, as you said, that when you were there, so the Islam in, in your perception was different, and then you are there, the perspective is quite different. I believe being Muslim, that if I'm a Muslim, it means my total submission uh, to, for my Allah Almighty, yeah. right? And with this modernization concept, how you can deviate from that fundamental point that your total submissions are for the one and the only one who is your creator. So how this modernization made a difference that I want to know what is the philosophy of that modern Islam in your opinion? Uh, so uh, to repeat the question for the people in, uh, on Zoom, the question is, what, given that there is this tension or this wrestling between modernity and Islam, and if Islam is about surrendering yourself to God and to the way of God, and that uh, he's ultimately um, um, the omnipotent, um, what kind of modernity of Islam is going uh, to look like? So. Here, um, I'm actually very hopeful because the, um, what we know historically in, in Islamic jurisprudence, there has been a tension between those who were interpreting the text literally and those who believe that no, God created us uh, with brains, with minds. So he expects us to interpret, to use our mind to, in order to uh, uh, implement Islam in the way it's to get the results we're supposed to get. We cannot get the same results in every place, in every time using the same traditional ways. While the literalists would argue, no, Islam, uh, the Quran is perfect. It is the word of God the way it is. Interpretation is Satan uh, 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 trying to corrupt you, right? So these are, have always been schools of thought in, in, in Islam. Uh, likewise, today, what we see, especially after the Arab Spring, in Tunisia, in Turkey, uh, even in, in, in Jordan and in Iraq, in Iraq uh, you have Islamists who realize that Islam, uh, if, if, I, if I'm a true Muslim and I believe that my, uh, my responsibility is to proselytize and to push forward Islam, I need to understand what does Islam look like in 2022, right? And for example, Nahda, uh, uh, part of the Islamist party in Tunisia, um, they, they were at an impasse when they were in power and they were working on the constitution, the uh, Tunisian constitution, and they knew that they could try to pass a constitution with 54% of the vote uh, the way they would like it. But they, they knew if it's going to be a constitution, we need 99% of Tunisians to vote for it. So they accepted certain uh, articles in the constitution that no Islamic movement would have accepted like the rights of women and what have you, because they understood that practically speaking, if, if we are to be successful, we need to exist and we need to thrive. And we need a democratic system 
that stays intact so that we can function and people consensually adopt our ideas, right? Because they saw also what happened in Egypt. So there's a lot of machinations uh, that started happening also in, in Palestine, like people, uh, my aunt was a big supporter of Hamas, but then with ISIS, right? People start saying, oh my God, like just because somebody is religious, it doesn't mean they're good, right? Making the distinction that attributes have nothing to do with behaviors, right? So that distinction is happening. And there, are, there is a lot of, like uh, ijtihad, um, right? There is a lot of new thinking, but it's, it's taking its time. And I think that's more the reason to support democratic change because uh, Hamas did not expect to win in 2006. And they learned a lot of lessons, thanks to being put in a situation where they realize it's easy to be in opposition and just throw stones. It's much more difficult when you need to deliver on jobs, on, then they understood that they need to compromise, right? They're like, you can't have it all, right? So that kind of machination is very critical. Uh, let's take the other side. Yes, please go ahead. Are we seeing that a number of Eastern countries are uh, considering uh, accepting uh, playing this country? This is going to affect the thoughts of Palestine that what's going to be. So the question is uh, how does it impact the Palestinians that a lot of uh, Islamic countries are uh, looking at uh, have establishing relationship, uh, relationships with Israel? Uh, definitely that uh, undermines the Palestinian cause. Uh, however, Palestinians are not surprised. Um, Palestinians do make the distinction between the people and the regimes. Um, so even in the 1980s, Palestinians knew very well that um, the Arab regimes were praying for Israel to kick out the PLO more than the Israelis were, right? Because we understood that for the Arab regimes, the PLO and the Palestinians were a burden. Um, there, there's a lot that has to do with the regional politics with Palestine that has to do with um, semblance of support to Palestine um, whenever it suits them. Uh, but now Arab populations also have their own issues, especially after the Arab Spring uh, in Iraq. I know there is a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, negative feelings towards Palestinians because Saddam privileged Palestinians in Iraq, right? And unfortunately, a lot of suicide bombers in Iraq were Palestinian. Right, so uh, there is this sense of we're sick and tired of the Palestinian cause. It only got us problems, and if uh, getting on the good side of Israel gets us on the good side of the United States, then maybe we should do that. And that's exactly what why the UAE went that way. The UAE early on understood that in order to be in the U.S. favor, they need to be in the Israel favor. Right, uh, so it's it's purely pragmatic. Um, but I'm not worried about that because I ultimately, I think in many ways, um, the same way that the first intifada erupted only after the PLO was kicked out into Tunis and Palestinians had to depend on themselves. Mm -hmm. And likewise, the nonviolent movement in, in Bil'in and Na'lin and, and, and uh, Kharbat and other places uh, 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 came about only after the Palestinians lost hope that the Palestinian Authority can do anything. Uh, I think likewise, uh, uh, not looking outside for support uh, and doing our own thing and then accepting support whenever it comes on our own terms and not begging for that support, right? Not, not seeking that support is healthier for the Palestinians. Um, yes, please go ahead. Uh, following up on your statement about the uh, how does Islam look like in 2022? What is the percentage of young people, let's say age less than 30, uh, percentage of Palestinian population, and how do, because they are much more exposed to the social media globally, how do they see that? That's a very good question. Yes, they are a majority. I, I don't know the numbers exactly, but they are definitely the, the bigger segment of Palestinian society is under 30. Uh, and they differ. The ones in Gaza are different from the ones in the West Bank. Um, you cannot say that the ones in Gaza are all conservative. Some of the most secular and more liberal Palestinian youth are in fact in Gaza and they do amazing work. Um, the, I would say five years ago, they were more conservative. Now secular and, and uh, liberal uh, young Palestinians are bolder. Uh, because they see it's literally it is their future 
and um, they need to create it. They cannot wait for their parents to do things right. Um, so there are a lot of machinations. At the same time, you know, the, the Islamic youth um, have a tension between those who are, again, obedient, right, and follow what their uh, elders tell them, and those who believe that, no, this is our country. Uh, by the way, this is the same challenge that the Muslim Brotherhood has, the ones in Turkey and the ones in Egypt, right? Uh, the younger generation who believes that, no, we, we need to create our own uh, political uh, ideology. So it, it's a conversation, but it's a lively one, for sure. Uh, yes, please. Uh, just a question or two or before. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Uh, you mentioned that uh, and there were hope, as you just mentioned, that the uh, Palestinian state could be external, but it could not be materialized. And you have just shown the map of uh, Gaza and West Bank, the way it is divided into 300 pockets, in fact, and uh, it is surrounded, no pocket is more than one mile or even less than that. And a Palestinian has to cross even as many as 50 uh, you know, uh, checkpoints into uh, Palestine, into Israeli area, and there is no uh, facility for economic development and well-being of the people. So, what do you think that uh, the youth in Palestine would be accepting gradually uh, that they should be part of Israel and they would be more uh, safe and uh, you know economically uh, well-being would be done? Uh, definitely. So uh, just to corroborate what you said, the World Bank itself. So first, the challenge with the checkpoints is that very few of them are between Palestine and Israel. Most of them are between Palestinian areas. So it's between those islands. Uh, when I used to work, I used to cross anywhere between five to seven checkpoints, just going from Birzeit to Bethlehem, one way and then on the way back. Right. And that's just going to Bethlehem. The only there was two in, in Jerusalem. Right. Um, so that's the main challenge. And the World Bank itself came with a report that the Palestinian economy, economy is not stifled out of poverty, it's stifled because of movement. If Palestinians have no, uh, act, uh, freedom of movement, their economy would in fact thrive. The, the Palestinian economy was doing very well in 99. It was doing better than Jordanian and Egyptian economies. Palestinians are not poor, they're just stifled, right? And that was the argument of uh, former President uh, uh, Salam Fayyad is that we need to show the world that we're not a poor people, we're just a, a, a state in, in abeyance, right? Like we could be a very good, a prosperous state. It's just we're not being given the opportunity. Look what we're able to do under occupation. Can you imagine what we can do if we were not occupied? Uh, and how that in and of itself creates an interest for us not to go to war. If we are prosperous and we have our freedoms, like why would we want to jeopardize that, right? Um, so now currently, uh, yes, because the two-state solution has failed and, and almost no one believes in it anymore. Uh, Palestinians are of two minds. One is, okay, the occupation is gonna stay until we get rid of it. Uh, and some are arguing for uh, citizenship in Israel, right? Like it's, it's pointless if, if the Israelis feel so strongly and are so in, uh, prioritizing settlements and occupying the West Bank, then we need equal rights. Now, the challenge with that is that no one is actually having a political platform that is genuinely arguing the one state, that is, a platform that says, okay, everybody is equal in that state and we have these rights and so on and so forth. It's, it's a theoretical, it's a kind of a pipe dream, uh, but very, I mean, there are a few people that are working on it, but the, it's not the majority. The majority talk about the one state just as a, a, a protest against the two state because the two state ended up in, in shambles. Economically speaking, um, I, I never cease to be amazed at how Palestinians are, are creative and and uh, innovative, there is a lot of um, innovation in tech, in the service industry. Um, there's a great project called uh, um, Gaza Sky Geeks, look it up. Uh, it's an incubator in Gaza and they do amazing innovations, majority of whom are women, young women. Uh, similarly in the tech sector, Google employs a lot of people. And now a lot of them, I mean, Google has an office in Israel and they work like uh, remotely. So there is that too. Uh, but there is also, you know, construction, there is, um, yeah, there, there are different opportunities, but yeah, there, people manage. I mean, I, I was, again, I was telling Charlie, I, I was there last summer, and I haven't been there for three years because of COVID, and it's changed a lot, and there are a lot of businesses. Like, in, in my, in Birzeit, uh, we have like, you know, 
three dessert places. We have three vet, vets, and it's like a population of like 5,000 people, right? When I was there like three years ago, we didn't have anybody having pets. And now we have three, three vets. Like, where does that come from? So like, it's, you never know what happens. They're, they're very uh, uh, entrepreneurial and very um, resourceful. That's, if anything, Palestinians have always been resourceful. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I was just wondering, sort of ranging off from the youth, how does the situation currently affect the younger women in particular? Because um, since you said that there was still a debate between the traditionalists and the modernists, mm -hmm. so and having these women from the first and the second and the fathers, maybe as their mothers or grandmothers, mm -hmm. and the younger women, so how does that sort of work? Again, a very interesting. Um, I highly recommend you watch a movie called uh, uh, Naila. And the uprising, um, N A I L A, Naila, Naila, and the uprising. Naila was one of the um, women leaders of the first intifada. Um, and the people who produce this, they're amazing, Just Vision. Um, they're very good at that. They, they create uh, visual, like video uh, content um, that addresses an important question. And one of them was, few Palestinians realize the role that women played in the first intifada, the crucial role they played. Like people don't realize, no, they were the actual leaders because all the men were in jails, right? Um, uh, so you do have a young generation of women, uh, young Palestinian women, uh, who are doing all sorts of things. They, they are leaders of, of you know, uh, NGOs. Epicry is co-directed by a, a Palestinian uh, young woman, um, Nivin Sanduka. Um, here, there are a few in the States uh, new story leadership. The leader was um, oh, a, a young woman from um, from Hawara. So you do have those, and and there are those who are very liberal, and like they date and what have you. And you have those who are conservative, and, and they're not conservative in in you know uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, terms as much as no. They genuinely believe that these are important values. They believe that as women uh, wearing the veil helps them not be sexualized and being respected in society and being respected for their merit and for their intelligence and for their contribution as opposed to being objectified. And so they would argue, uh, um, right, a, a woman in a bikini, that's being objectified. Yeah. When I'm wearing the veil, I'm not being objectified, right? Uh, I have a friend of mine, she, she's not religious, but she worked, her expertise is uh, Sharia jurisprudence. So she says, when I, when I wear the veil, I have access. I can do my research, you know? And the judges, they, they respect me and they actually engage in, in dialogue over the Sharia law, you know? So th there is that too. And again, what is lovely is that it's a real conversation. Um, higher rates of divorce, perfectly fine. Before it was taboo. Conservative women divorcing, yeah. So it is definitely changing. Uh, yes. So I There, 2015, 2016, um, at the Israeli University. One of the things I noticed, mm -hmm. so, is, is, shout uh, out. Um, one of the things I noted that had emerged with this new generation was a much greater desire and propensity to connect with international solidarity. So to connect the Palestinian struggle, not as its own thing, but as a struggle that connects to global struggles. So I wonder if you could speak to that. Uh, yes, I'm glad that you asked this question. So the question was about uh, your name again? Steve. Stephen, your experience in Palestine, how this new generation is eager to connect with other struggles in the world and not um, international struggles and making uh, the issue of Palestine part of the general struggle for freedom and equality for all peoples. Uh, so you have two currents, one that is pragmatic, realizing that uh, the PA is a problem, the Palestinian Authority is part of the problem now, is part of the occupation and is part of the problem, and therefore you cannot depend on its institutions, and the PLO is, has been sidelined. Therefore, we need the connections and the solidarity of different uh, uh, groups in the world, and to make our issue uh, part of the struggles of the Native Americans, of the African Americans, that it's, it's the same struggle, which I would agree with. It is the same struggle, right? Um, and then there are those who are in genuine solidarity, you know, Palestinians who studied abroad, uh, or Palestinian Americans, like one of the... Um, Famous active, uh, famous um, uh, main leaders of, of uh, Ferguson. He was Palestinian, Masri, right? And he, he actually died, but I don't think he died from it, from it. But like 
his solidarity was genuine because he was from Ferguson and he, he as a colored Palestinian, you know, experienced the racism of the police, right? So the, the, the intersectionality between uh, Black Lives Matters and, and the Palestinian Solidarity Movement is genuine. Uh, Palestinians contacted over social media, uh, you know, resistance actors in Ferguson and told them what to do when they get hit with uh, tear gas and how to, how to disperse and how to communicate from their experience, right? So it is genuine solidarity. Same with, uh, um, with the Native Americans and, and, and so forth. So you have both types. And again, this generation is um, far more um, mature and intelligent. Like if you, if you, if you see how uh, Mohammed al-Kurd, the Palestinian, young Palestinian who, uh, whose house uh, or his family is getting kicked out of their house in Jerusalem, the way he speaks, you, you think he, he's read, uh, you know, all, all, all political uh, uh, science books. So there is that, that, uh, that maturation and that sense of, again, they're not waiting for anybody to tell them what to do. They're figuring it out uh, and they are very active. They're not, they're not uh, uh, passive. Now the challenge is um, it's, it's incomplete in my opinion. A, a lot of work is inward looking and is not genuinely uh, or not, uh, not uh, earnestly thinking of drawing a future, right? So it's all about resistance, it's all about uh, uh, being a bulwark for the occupation against the occupation and stopping uh, also uh, cultural appropriation by Israel, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, falafel, uh, embroidery, Israel is trying to appropriate all of that uh, culture and the Palestinians are fighting back. So you have all of these falafel shops that are Palestinian, the Jerusalem falafel, and you're Palestinian, right? So we realize the importance of that, right? Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't say, okay, so what's next? What are we fighting for? We're fighting for our freedom. What is that freedom going to look like? That is a, um, a conversation that's still absent, unfortunately. And um, I, I'm, I'm a person who's trying to actively engage it. And it's a hard conversation because it often comes across as uh, defeatist. That why do we want to talk to the Israelis or why do we want to talk to Jewish Americans? Uh, they are part of the problem. We need to boycott them and we need to, well, I believe that boycotts work, but I think boycotts need to be smart and need to be strategic to be effective. And Boycotts only work so much until you actually have a platform for the future that includes the other, right? So uh, Nelson Mandela wasn't just trying to get rid of apartheid. He was creating a new South Africa, right? So he spoke with his wardens. He tried to understand what is important to them and why is rugby so important to, to the white South, uh, South Africans, right? Likewise, Gandhi. Gandhi didn't want to just get rid of the British. He wanted the Indians to be able to rule India, right? We still don't have the Gandhi of Palestine. I think there are a few and they're dispersed, but we don't have that platform yet. Again, I'm, I am hopeful that we're gonna get there and it might need to take a, 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 a clean, you know, Palestine only conversation to then be able to step to the next step of, okay, so what is, what is it going to look like when we find the solution with the Israelis? Uh, let's just say this side then. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you for your lecture. So you had mentioned that um, between 2005 and 2008, you were advising um, Palestinian Authority and also on peace negotiations, I believe. And of course, in 2008, there was some discussion of yeah. the Bolton's offer. And of course, multiple reasons maybe why that didn't pan out. But I'm kind of curious as to your perspectives and maybe advice at the time, given um, for Mr. Olmert's kind of. Um, gestures, offers, what have you. And then I was, and then in addition, I was going to ask in terms of today, you were saying hardly anybody believes in the two state solution of Palestinians. But when I look at a lot of um, and, uh, your fantastic polls, as you know, of the Palestinian yeah. perspectives, and while that um, support for two states has decreased because of the stagnation of the peace process, it seems like um, again and again and again, there's still a plurality of support in contrast to any one alternative other solution. Um, and so in that sense, it seems like there is still um, at least some relative support even if you believe at least that has decreased. So I was wanting to get a Sure, so there are two questions. Um, uh, one about uh, what, was, uh, what was it like, uh, the experience uh, participating in negotiations between 2003 and 2008, especially with all Mat Abbas talks that came very close to a resolution. I'll talk about that for sure. And the second is, um, while I said that the hardly anybody supports the two-state solution in Palestine anymore, uh, polls still show uh, that depending on how you ask the question, 
there is still a plurality. And that is also correct. I'm glad you asked that question. So to answer the first one, uh, yes, we were part of that negotiations and I can uh, tell you for sure that Abbas and Omer did come to a lot of bridging proposals. However, <laughs> both of them also realized that neither of them could sell it to their constituents. And in fact, as far as I was concerned, when I saw that, I realized, okay, we cannot work at this level. We really need to work at the grassroots. That's when I realized that what, we're, what we have a dearth of leadership in Palestine and Israel. Abbas, and even before that, Arafat, kept telling us that uh, we're gonna have a state without paying a price, right? And similarly, the Israelis, uh, the leaders were telling people, in fact, I would argue they're not leaders, they're people in authority. A leader thinks of the next generation, a politician thinks of the next election, right? So the people in authority did not do their work to prepare their populations to what peace would require and why war and military means are in fact maybe uh, easy fixes or, or may, may make us feel good but it's really like drugs. It's really not helping and ultimately is making the situation worse. So uh, the work needs to be at the grassroots and that's part of why I, I left because I realized, no, we need to work at the grassroots and get Palestinians having an internal conversation of what do we really want? What's really important about Jerusalem? What's really important about refugees? And likewise, the Israelis. It's like, uh, there is a very good um, uh, Jewish American um, political scientist, uh, Ian Lustig, um, and uh, I love it. He, he goes to, to Israel often and speaks with different Israelis, especially religious uh, 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 conservatives in Israel, often settlers. And he asks them this question. Can you see, can you articulate a future for Israel that is both desirable and possible? Like that's ultimately the question. Yes, I, it would be great if there were no Jews, no Israelis in Palestine. That would be the easiest thing. And likewise, for Israel, it would be great if they woke up and didn't find any Palestinian in Eris Israel. Sure, but are you able to do that? And what kind of person are you when you do that, right? So that is the question that is missing. Uh, so which relates to uh, the second part or the second question you had, which is correct. Uh, in po it is relative, it depends how you ask the question. If you, uh, the majority of Palestinians and Israelis, uh, um, at, or at least a plurality now, it used to be a majority 10 years ago, now it's just a plurality, believe that of all the solutions, the two-state solution is, uh, is the best. However, uh, they don't believe that the other side is going to do it. So if you say, okay, in a scenario where the other side accepts the two-state solution, would you accept it? They say yes. And then you hit the 60 and 70%. So the problem is the lack of faith in the other side delivering, whether being willing or capable of. Israelis think Abbas is willing, they just think he's incapable of delivering, right? And likewise, Palestinians believe that the Israelis are unwilling to accept a two-state solution because they voted Netanyahu after he said, there will never be a Palestinian state on my watch. Like, people forget that. Like, Palestinians heard that very well, right? So it's, it's not believing that the other side wants it. And to further give you proof to that, um, for better or worse, and often when I say that Palestinians uh, criticize me for saying it, but the fact that you have spaces like Ramallah, Bethlehem, Nablus, where Palestinians are unencumbered with Israelis is a big deal. So when push comes to shove, Palestinians are happy in their bubble of Ramallah because they're not having to deal with Israelis, to have a space where it's their own. In fact, a lot of uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel move to Ramallah just because they're sick and tired of having to deal with a, a, a society that believes in Zionism and so on and so forth. In, in Ramallah, in Nablus, they can be themselves, right? Be Palestinian, be proud of their culture and not having to compromise every single moment of every single day, right? So when you ask them, okay, if you believe in the one state solution, uh, that means it will be one state. And in the army, you'd be fighting with a, a Israeli Jew. I said, no, no, that's not acceptable. Okay, so what kind of one state are you talking about, right? So when push comes to shove, they want to not see an Israeli and be in a smaller place than to be in, a, in all of Palestine and be with Israelis. And of course, there are those who want to get rid of all of Israelis, right? So when you ask, okay, reverse engineer for me, how are you gonna do that? And what kind of Palestine would that be when we throw them all out? We'd have, we would have done the same thing that they did to us in 1948. So, but nobody's having that conversation. Everybody's just looking here, right? Like, nobody, everybody's talking about the desirable, nobody's talking about the possible. But 
understandably because they are being killed, they are being persecuted, and they're being uh, uh, suffered. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Mr. Zahra for